Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and this video we're breaking down Dune Part 2. You are not prepared for what is to come. The IMAX extravaganza is now out worldwide, and it's easy one of the best sequels of all time. The space opera epic has a lot to unpack from it, and throughout this video we're going to be breaking it all down. This will cover the plot, differences to the book, and also what we think is going to happen in Messiah. Denny Villeneuve's revealed he's working on this script, and we can look at the books to see where things could possibly go. So grab your popcorn bucket, saddle up to ride that worm, and follow your host Paul as we get into the movie. Heavy spoilers ahead, and if you haven't seen it, then what you been June, eh? Now, now we will to also talk about Messiah, but I'll give you a warning before we get into that. I'm nice like that. By the way, thank you for clicking this. Now let's break down Dune Part Two. It's okay. I'm here. I'm here. It's been a while since you've had one of those nightmares. Tell me, what was it about? It's only fragments. Nothing's clear. Now the movie picks up almost directly after part one, where we saw Paul Atreides had obtained desert power. The first film had his father taking the family to Arrakis because they wanted to harness that for themselves. On their home of Kaladin, they'd pulled together water power, and this would give them an advantage in the universe. The family were already extremely popular, and harnessing spice would make them the dominant house. Thus, both the Emperor and Harkonnens wanted to take the family down, which led to what we saw happening in that first film. Now we pick up with Paul, Lady Jessica and the Fremen, who begin by making their way through the desert. Along with them they carry Jamis' body, who ended up being Paul's first kill. Throughout the film he had visions of his death, but in the end it was explained this was metaphorical. When you take a life, you take your own. Paul killing Jamis meant that the old person he was died, and thus in the end rose the Kwisatz Haderach. Their brutal knife fight also set the stage for part 2, as we have an even fiercer one that closes out the film. This is bitterly poetic, as it's against its opposite Fade, and Jessica was meant to have a daughter that was gonna marry the character. Paul and Fade both come from millennia of gene selection, which was carried out by the Bene Gesserit. They've been trying to create a supreme being brought in together by selective breeding, in which select members of houses then had children. Jessica's daughter was meant to wed with Fade, and then it would unite these two powerful houses. The Jesserit have also crafted a religion in which people across the universe would worship this being. It would basically bring together religion and the state, and mean that they have someone who rules over all. This person would be in the Jesserit's pocket, and thus they'd decide the fate of the universe. You see, the universe is dominated by the patriarch, and women don't really have any official power. Even someone like Jessica is simply just a concubine, and she's not seen as being an equal to the duke. Most women are relegated to servants' roles, and this child will allow the Jessica to rule the universe. However, the duke ended up wanting a son, and because Jessica loved him, she granted him his wish. This wrecked their plans, but as always, there's plans within plans within June, and we will go into that a bit later in the video. Now we are also introduced early on to the Emperor's daughter Irulan, who in the films played by Florence Pugh. Each chapter of the book actually opens with a piece from her, which are taken from the in-universe text. This comes in the aftermath of Paul's Jihad, which we're clearly going to explore as we get to Dune Messiah. The film does play off of that though, as we have her dictating her diary, but it runs concurrently with the story instead of being in its aftermath. Now we learn Arrakis is slowly but surely being taken over by the Baron's nephew Raban, who we were introduced to in that first film. They're moving further up north, and we get to see a closer look at their suspense attack. This is used by the Baron in order to get around, and because of his hedonistic lifestyle, he relies heavily on it. In the book, we discover what actually happened with him, and it turned out this was brought on by a curse. The Baron forced himself on a guy's Helen Moheim, and she infected him with a cell-destroying disease. We see a small part of his brutality early on as he kills his servants after his nephew continues to fail him. In the book we learn that this was actually a strategy, and that Raban was put in place because of his ferocity. The plan was to then replace him with Fade, so that the people would welcome this slightly kinder touch. Either way though, they would still retain their power, and rule over Arrakis with an iron grip. 
Now it is hinted at, but it's not spelled out completely, and it adds some extra strategy that you might have missed when watching it. Talking about you, mate, you're always missing this stuff, so I've got to over-explain it, and that's why this video is 45 minutes long or whatever. Anyway, Paul is almost killed, but he's saved by his mother, who reminds her son not to leave his back open. This is a lesson Gurney Halleck tried to drill into him at the start of the first movie, and we see it paying off much more in this film. Eventually, they make it to North Arrakis, where Jamis is given a true burial. This differs things up slightly from the book, as here Paul finds out he's got some brand new responsibilities. Turns out if you kill a Fremen, you also have to look after their family, so Paul's got to look after Jamis's on top of his own. Oh, for fuck's sake. He's allowed to keep Jamis's wife as his wife, or a servant for one year, until she decides what she wants to do. He's also got Chani and Erlan as well, and yeah mate, hoes in different area codes. Also missing is the entire subplot of Howat. How it was the Atreides mentat, played by Stephen McKinley Henderson, who unfortunately is missing from part 2. In the book though, he played a major role after the defeat of the Atreides, and the Baron took him prisoner and injected him with poison. This was slow acting, and he was forced to serve the Baron, however, he worked in the background to manipulate the house. One of these plots was to take out Fade, and he ended up using a non-drugged Atreides fighter as opposed to a slave. This ended up causing the Game Master to be killed, and it's a shame it was cut as it was such a cool moment. Now in part 2, Fade's tested by his uncle instead, and it's all part of that plot to make him seem like a great hero. This is so he can be sent to Arrakis to take over, and they're doing lots of PR and spin to make him seem like a solid guy. And while that's missing, we do get an expanded role for Shishakli, who's sceptical of Paul's prophecy. Paul's also resistant to his destiny of being the Messiah, as he wrestles with the fact he could lead to death and destruction. Unlike Luke Skywalker or Aragorn, his destiny of saving Arrakis is a poison chalice that could kill 61 billion. It will simply not stop with the defeat of the Harkonnens and he'll fight all of the great houses just to cement his spot. Herbert recognised the power of religion and how people will gladly kill if it's in the name of God. We know from our own history that people have committed several horrendous acts because they believe that they were doing it for a higher power. Thus the followers of Paul could kill billions in his name, so him getting the throne isn't exactly a victory. But the big question that June asks is whether the prophecy is coming true, or if it's the fact that they know about the prophecy that they're now forcing it to happen. We all know from real life that coincidence can happen, and that they can either be interpreted one of two ways. For example, yeah, when my granddad died, we went round my nana's and saw that the door to his chill out room had been left open. Manana swore that she'd closed it when leaving the house and thought that this showed that his spirit had returned home. Now, there may have been a rational reason for this, but either way, it kind of demonstrates the point. Jessica's intent on him becoming the Messiah, and she sees his actions as matching with the prophecies. Over the course of the movie, she spreads the gospel of Paul's exploits, which slowly starts to indoctrinate the people. The Northern Fremen are not all that religious, but over time, they start to believe. This is even in the face of Chani doubting it's the truth, and she chalks it up to being false hope. Lady Jessica is then made the Reverend Mother, and this transformation is brought on when she drinks their water of life. Made from the bile of a sandworm, it gives the power of foresight, and she gains the genetic memory of everyone that came before. This includes a Baron who just so happens to be her father, which is a big twist that they kept out the first film. Spoiler alert. <laughs> Now the idea of genetic memory is something that opened up the first film with his getting these lines even before the logos. This line has a lot of importance and the second film begins with power over spice is power over all. Why this matters here is because Paul ends up controlling Arrakis and thus he controls the most valuable resource in the galaxy. Though the great houses want to overthrow him, he controls how they travel, their weapons, when they hit the thumbs up, and how their mentats and cooperate so he's able to control them all. It's an important line to open the film up with, and it sums up why Paul becomes the God Emperor. Now many thought that that voice could be later the second, looking back on his own family history. Genetic memory is something that Herbert was fascinated with, and it's something that we see most notably in nature. For example, birds know when they have to migrate, and all of this happens seemingly by instinct. In this universe, the people can get into their genetic memory, which is something that Jessica can now also do too. Now the reason that not everyone sips the water of life is because it can be deadly. Jessica survives it because she's had poisoning training, but they don't bring into the fact that she's also carrying a baby. This leads to her yet unborn daughter Alia gaining immense power, and she's able to communicate with Jessica from the womb. It's possible that we even heard her talking in the first film, as that voice sounded like how she talks here.
Paul also drinks from the water of life and Alia works with her mother to push him further to the prophecy. Alia is a character who's changed up massively from the book as she doesn't end up being born in the film. She appeared in both the book and 84 film though and she was the character who ended up killing the Baron. There she was roughly 3 years old but highly advanced for her, her very young age. Due to her powers she was considered an abomination but I think we're probably going to skip the young years of her life. We see her in her future form and she's played by the fantastic Anya Taylor-Joy. She's so hot right now and I mean this cast of hottest actors on the planet they had to include her too. She's shown as an adult in the vision and she reveals Paul to Harkonnen by the way of his mother. For Messiah I think we'll just get a massive time jump, skip all that younger stuff and have her attracting people through her cult of personality. In the book she somewhat rivals Paul and two taps in the religious dogma to use it as a weapon. Now Paul adapts the Fremen way of life pretty easily which makes sense as in part 1 he put on his still suit in the most optimal way. We see as he's tested across the desert and it's here he forges a romantic bond with Chani. However he's played by visions of her death and that of countless people. This includes his mother who urges him to keep himself ready for a political marriage which will be with Princess Erlan. This was something that was hinted at in part 1 when they had to flee the Sadikar. Suppose I presented the Emperor with an alternative to chaos and his daughters are yet to marry. You'd make a play for the throne. Chani doesn't want him to follow through on it though. She believes creating the Messiah will lead to more deaths. In the book she originally woke him up from the water of life hallucination thing by her own choice but here yeah, she's forced into doing it. This is because she doubts the prophecy and somewhat feels like it could usher in the end. This unfortunately falls on deaf ears and Jessica heads south to spread the word of Paul. Now in a rather crude comparison it's sort of similar how Morpheus believes in Neo is the one. Paul starts to become a Fremen and even rides a sandworm first time. It reminded me of the jump program in the Matrix where they all sit around and wonder if he's going to be able to do it. He is the one. What I don't think they take into account though is something that was hammered home more in the source material. You see Paul was trained by the best of the best of the best sir and this was in every aspect of humanity. He had the best mentats training him mentally, best fighters and also the best linguists which is why he's able to speak so many languages. Jamis underestimated him and thought he was just a little spoiled rich kid when in reality he'd already fought against the best. This is how he's able to do so much from the off and the deeper into it you get the more there's doubt in the prophecy. Either way Paul and Chani take out raids on a spice harvester and we get to see some of the weaponry in action. They aim to disrupt the spice production as much as possible and in turn this will waste the Harkonnen's resources. It's sort of a flip on how they left the equipment for the Atreides with them purposely leaving damaged tech to make things more difficult. Now Herbert was inspired by Lawrence of Arabia with a story of Dune sharing several similarities. Spice also works as a simile of oil with it being a natural resource that people seek to exploit. The Harkonnen's work is an allusion to outside invaders which can easily be swapped out for several real world groups. Whether it's the Soviets invading Afghanistan or the Iraq war the piece has a lot of things that you can apply to real life. It's in this why I think Dune still feels relevant even though the book was published nearly 60 years ago. Other similarities include the weapons that the Fremen end up using with them essentially equipping stinger missiles. The stinger was provided by the Mujahideen by the US and was a big big game changer in the war against the Soviets. The name Harkonnen was even picked because it sounded Russian and Herbert also took elements of Hitler's Third Reich. Now it's these that lead to them getting several successful raids and Paul's given his friend a name which is the Muad'Dib. This is after the desert mouse that appeared several times in the first film and there acted as a symbol of strength. If a tiny mouse could survive in the desert then it showed that others could too. The Muad'Dib can also see what's coming and on top of this they create their own water. It's apt as Paul can indeed see visions of the future and witnesses himself making water on Arrakis. Slowly the legend of the Muad'Dib grows and it creates a symbol for the Fremen to unite behind. On top of this the Harkonnens believe that Paul died in the desert and therefore they don't fully consider the threat that's coming for them. Now during one of the raids we get the welcome return of Josh Brolin's gurney. Finally playing as Balaset this was absent from the first film after the planned scene for it ended up being cut. Gurney's now a smuggler and we learn how he was able to escape alongside Atreides survivors due to the Fremen. He's a victim of one of Paul's attacks, however he survives as Paul knew his stride. Don't stand with your back to the door. How many times do we have to tell you? I can tell you by your footsteps, Gurney Halleck. I recognize your footsteps, old man. Paul instantly rekindles their teacher and student relationship and he's shown how to harness atomic weapons. 
In the Dune universe, they're highly frowned upon, and this is due to their excessive use in the Butlerian Jihad. This is something I hope we explore more in the future, as I think a prequel set around this could fit our times well. Now in case you don't know, humanity became reliant on AI, and it ended up basically doing a Terminator. This started a war between man and machine, and it was the former who came out on top. Humanity used atomic weapons on the machine god, and this led to both of them being outlawed. This is why they have Mentats, so they don't rely on computers, and it's illegal to make a machine that's more intelligent than man. The book was also written during 1965, in which society was fearful of nuclear weapons. 20 years prior had seen the atom bomb being used, leading to a nuclear arms race in a decade-spanning Cold War. It's very apt now, as it feels like we're always on the brink of war, and the threat of AI exists in almost every job. There's always the fear of what's on the horizon, and Paul's visions also signal dangers right around the corner. He wrestles with whether it's set in stone he's meant to be a tyrant, or if it's possible that we can make our own future. Even though he wants to avoid it though, he still ends up stepping towards it every day. Deep down, it's kind of clear that he wants it, but it creates a grim future for billions and billions of people. Now in the end, because of the raid, they eliminate 60% of the harvest. This sends Raban into a rage, and he goes out to kill the Muad'Dib once and for all. Give me what I want! Give not me what I want! That's not what I want! I want you and WrestleMania! It's in this that he sees the legend and Paul are one and the same, and you see fear across his face as the pair meet. Gurney's the one who takes him out in the end, and it's very much a number two versus number two, like two girls, one cup. Now the superior tactics of the Fremen defeat them, and the Emperor finally begins to take notice. He suspects that it could indeed be Paul, and within his own house there are seeds of dissent. Irulan herself is a Bene Gesserit, and she's instructed to then spy on her father. She also twists his arm and says his death would lead to martyrdom, and only a full-scale war would allow the Emperor to go on his peacemaker. Even then, it isn't guaranteed a payoff, and because he doesn't have the foresight of Paul, he's very much taking risks. Now on the other side of this, the Reverend Mother has another plan, which involves manipulating Fade. She sends Margot Fenring to go and have his child, and they start to work out if there's a way they can control him. We meet Fade as he's preparing for his birthday celebrations, and he's taking part in a gladiator spectacle. For me, the guide prime scenes were the standout of the film, with them being shown in that stunning black and white. H.R. Geiger provided a lot of the designs for the cancelled first film attempt, and they're laced throughout these scenes, adding flavour to these moments. It's unlike anything I've ever really seen before, and it's a welcome break from the deserts of Arrakis. Fade is played perfectly by Austin Butler, and I'm happy to report that he's exercised that cursed spirit of Elvis. He's a psychotic nutcase who gets pleasure and pain, and kills indiscriminately, which gives him a real sting, eh? Fuck off. Now this brutality is much to the joy of his harem of creepy women, and he's one of the most memorable aspects of the movie. We also have Stelgar, who really, really shines here, and Javier Bardem acts as the face of the Fremen. He helps to show how they as a people all fall in line, and also highlights how they can lose too. Paul is pressured into challenging his leadership, and he finally accepts his messianic destiny. He declares himself Lisan al-Gaib, and challenges the Emperor's rule as he confronts the Baron. Using nukes, he storms the Arakeen fortress, and kills the Baron once and for all. Now Paul threatens to destroy the planet's spice with the rest of his nukes, unless the Emperor surrenders the Imperial throne. Paul says the Emperor has to fight him 1v1, which will be easy because the guy's got the best controllers. Just look at the controllers! Fate, however, ends up accepting the challenge, which leads to sheer cinema. It's fucking cinema! This will go down as one of the most gripping blade battles of all time, and it's made better by the fact they're mirror images of each other. The Baron wanted to install him by the way of blackmail, and he also took the test of the Gom Jabbar. Fate seemed to like it, whereas Paul found it painful, highlighting their opposites of the same coin. Paul also has Chani, and Fade has Margot Fenring, who is slightly simplified from how she's in the book. She's there to secure his bloodline in the end though, and the idea of children was hammered home more in the text. Made it from the work as Chani and Paul's child, who he named after his father Leto. However, he was killed in an attack, and thus I can totally understand why they left that all out. Still though, it's important to bear in mind that this victory carries a lot of weight, and again, it plays off the idea of Paul killing his metaphorical self. The book also adds in his inner monologue and puts some reasoning behind their mentalities in the scene. Fade is the talker, whereas Paul is silent, and this is done because it's something that unnerves him. In the book, Paul gets poisoned with the knife, but he uses his power to nullify the toxin. Here, Paul just lures him in as a way to stab him, and it seals victory for the Atreides. 
He also realises to make peace he must mend the houses and the marriage with Irulan is essentially just a name. Chani is of course his true partner and this idea of her being pushed out is also shown in the film's narration. The first movie had her doing some of the voiceover, whereas here it's provided mainly by Irulan. Highlights a change that's happening in Paul's destiny and that victory always comes with a cost. The idea of Paul also becoming his own man is highlighted in how he talks with the Benny. Consider what you're about to do, Paul Atreides. Silence! Whereas in the first film, it was her who said it to him. Silence! The Emperor then kneels before Paul's signet ring, which was worn by his father and his father before him. I told my father I didn't want this either. This rings a symbol of accepting his destiny and it's also what he was given to by Yue to confirm his father's death. Chani's furious with Paul's decision to wed Erlan and she leaves to ride her brand new sandworm. See, I see you're spending a lot of money on these worm effects as well mate. Well, you're paying way too much for worms man. Who's your worm guy? Now we discover that the Emperor sent us Sekula Secundus which was the original home planet of the Carino Empire. It's a harsh and awful place that looks like the common section when you mispronounce a name and it's a planet that breeds the Sudoku Empire fighters. It ain't exactly Florida for the old guy and the Great Houses also refuse to accept Paul. He instructs his Fremen to lead them to paradise which is basically the nice way of saying this. Kill them all. Highlights how Paul's now viewing things from a religious point of view and we see as Jessica and Alia confirm his holy wars now started. Anyway, that takes us into the spoilers for Messiah, so duck out if you don't want to know now. They might end up changing things, but I think certain elements will stay the same and that we will probably end up where how it ends off. Still though, that's your warning for some heavy, heavy spoilers and thanks for sticking with us until now. See you chump. You bloody chump. Now, if you're expecting to see Paul's holy war, then unfortunately our feeling might leave disappointed. I believe that we will get some teasers towards it, but I think it'll be mainly through the use of visions and flashbacks. That's something that especially was used in the first film and we'll be picking up in the aftermath of it. Dune Messiah starts off 12 years later and we watch as Paul's at the height of his power. I feel like he may be starting to terraform Arrakis, which is something that also happened in Paul's visions. In the first movie, Liette Kynes took Paul and Jessica to one of the Imperial labs on the planet and they found that they'd already been attempting it. Pardo Kynes aka Liette Kynes' father was adamant that the planet had once been a lush green world. With time he thought they could terraform the planet and turn Arrakis back into a paradise. This is actually how the 84 film ended and we watched as Paul started to change Arrakis. Now though, Paul's trying to do good for Arrakis and he's harvested the rest of the universe instead which is something that's brought enemies. The Bene Gesserit, Space Guild and Talaxiu, I think, uh, create a conspiracy to help take him down. The Talaxiu are basically a group of genetically altered humans who were believed to have created the spider creature in part 1. I know a lot of people thought that might be UA's wife but the Baron implied that she was dead so yeah, that's still just a theory time. Now the group aimed to use a goal out which is a clone of Duncan Idaho. This is used to manipulate Paul and it's hoped it'll make him question himself. However, the group likes games and they think that everyone should have a choice so they let Paul know that he's not the real Duncan. They want him to know and then see if he still falls but I kind of feel like that might be excised from the film. Now to make matters worse, Paul's also being plotted against by the Fremen. Erlan wants him to have a child and secure the bloodline but he's also promised Chani he'll only have kids with her. However, Erlan snuck contraceptives into Chani's food and this seemingly halts her from getting pregnant. Paul knows about the drugs though and is actually okay with it as he sees visions of Chani's death which comes from having children. And no, no, she doesn't die from a broken heart, but Paul, to be fair, he does hate sand. I don't like sand. Despite this, Chani ends up giving birth to twins, which wasn't something that appeared in Paul's visions. Surprise, motherfucker! Throughout the films, we've seen his Paul's not 100% accurate, which was also highlighted in his fight against the Sudukar. In the first movie, he saw this as himself, whereas here he believes that it's Chani. So yeah, man had twins, which hits a little close to home, because I'm Paul, and I remember getting that call and being like, Oh, yeah, so glad, so glad it's twins, um, but... Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Paul's also blinded by a nuke, and unfortunately, in another similarity to Star Wars, Chani still ends up dying. Also, yeah, I know June came first, mate. Stop that, stop that comment right now. Now, although there's all these other aspects going on, I feel like Alia is going to become the big player. The way they put her forth in this movie is way more sinister, and it's sort of teasing something bad's coming down the line. 
Anya Taylor-Joy is, of course, a massive actor, and she's someone who can pull off a more tender side, but also she's got that evil streak within her. She becomes a big religious leader and creates a cult and thus gains power. In the end, though, Paul defeats all of his enemies and decides to go into the desert like he's taking the long walk from Judge Dredd. This is because in the universe, this is something that blind people in the Fremen used to carry out. It was believed that because they were blind, they were going to be a burden, and thus this would lead to the tribe struggling. This would waste water, and so on and so forth, so it was expected that they take that long walk. He leaves Alia in charge, and Erlang cares for his kids, with the story continuing in the Children of Doom. It's a bit mental at points, mate, but if you want to know the story, you, you've got a couple of ways. You can YouTube it, wiki it, or go read the book, but Sci-Fi also adapted it with James McAvoy. That's probably the best way to take it in if you want to see it, because reading it, I was like, I have no idea what's going on here. So a TV adaptation, that really helps you out. I don't know if we'll get to that, but they are going ahead with Doom Messiah, as like I said, villain of scripts almost done. I can imagine this movie is going to do really well as well, because every IMAX showing seems to be sold out. I know there's still a chance that they might not go through with it, but I have to hold that faith in my heart and believe that Paul is the one. There's been a bit of a weird release with all these movies anyway, because the first one was impacted by the pandemic and the day and date release. HBO Max had 4K copies of the film the day it came out, and yet everyone was just doing a Jack Sparrow. Still though, they made money and there was obviously faith in the franchise, and I think this film is going to capitalise on it. They also hadn't greenlit the second one because they wanted to see how that did, but in hindsight, I actually think that helped. Had he filmed both parts back to back, then it's possible that he might not have grown as a filmmaker. The movie's being compared a lot to The Dark Knight, with it sharing a similar globe to Batman Begins. I think the gap between has allowed for proper planning in what's an incredible film. I think that the visuals really knock it out of the park, and viewing this on a massive screen made me appreciate its breadth and scale. The film tackles a lot of aspects of humanity, and there's several characters who will help to push these themes home. Feels personal while also feeling expansive and epic, and comes with deep characters who allow the actors to excel. This is a film that's full of big names, and those big names all give big, incredible performances. Even someone like Javier Bardem could be relegated to the background, but he takes the material and really shines with it. That's the case across the board too, with June being a massive way to showcase everyone's talents. Whether it's in the production, the cinematography or the CGI, everything feels like it's at the top of the industry. It's difficult not to completely fawn over a film like this, and I think it's set the bar high for 2024. Looking at what's to come, I'm not sure we'll get something that will live up to it, and this feels like it's elevated the industry. It's been a long, long time since I've been excited to go and see a movie like this, and I often worry that's going to leave me disappointed. However, June excelled my expectations, and I think The Batman was probably the last time I left the cinema feeling like this. It's up there for me with stuff like Endgame, Inception, The Dark Knight, where I leave completely blown away by what I've just seen. I think the first visit's going to be something that sticks with me for a long time, and yeah, what an incredible piece. Obviously, I try and give some negatives too, and I think that the runtime might leave some people bored. However, if you're immersed in this world, you know, you're already a fan of Dune or these kind of movies, then it's going to be something that you really fall in love with. Denny has managed to do the impossible, and he's elevated not only cinema, but also himself as a filmmaker. Everyone should support it and go and see films like this, and make sure you're Junior Part 2, eh? Hey, I had to end on a banger, and obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts, so drop them below in the comments section. Come on, that was a good one. Please drop a like on the video, and if you want to support the channel as a member of the Spoiler Society, then you can also do that by clicking the join button. You'll get early access to select videos every week, and it goes such a long way to helping us out. If you want to get some heavy spoilers merch, we've also just launched a brand new shop with new clothing, better improved quality, and much faster shipping. You can pick up our Theory Time ones, stuff from the boys, House of Dragons stuff, Marvel tees, and a lot more. We drop new designs on there all the time too, and it's a great way to help out the channel and help yourself out as well. Now, because you look, you dress like crap, mate. Now, if you want something else to watch, we've got a video on screen right now, so definitely head over there right after this. By the way, huge thank you for sticking through the video. I've been your host, Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care, and peace out.